Cone of shadow, blind spot. There are many ways to refer to a transducer's limitations when we're searching for targets or conducting a bottom analysis. In this video, I'll do my best to explain what the cone of shadow is, how it's generated, what its limitations are, and what steps can be taken to minimize its effects. Let's dive right into the presentation. Here, we have a representation of a boat, the sea, and the flat seabed at the moment. There's the fish finder screen on the right. I deliberately didn't include any depth numbers or specific measurements because depth isn't the key focus. These effects occur whether you're at 10 meters, 50 meters, 100 meters, or even 500 meters. It's all about scales and proportions. I could have put any numbers there. I'd like to let you know that at the end of the video, there will be a bonus, something extra related to shift and how it relates to the representation of the cone of shadow, the blind spot. Now let's take a look at the presentation together and try to understand what it is and how it works. We mentioned a flat seabed, and the two vertical lines represent the cone, the area where ultrasound is emitted. The top point in the red band on our fish finder represents the seabed, which corresponds to the nearest point. Pay attention to how I identify it, the closest point on the seafloor to our transducer. The lower part of our seabed, the lower part of our red band, corresponds to the outermost point of the radiation cone. Why is there this difference? because one point is higher and the other is lower. As you recall, the ultrasonic pulse originates from our transducer, goes towards the seafloor, and the fish finder measures the time it takes from when the pulse is sent to when it returns to the transducer. It's clear that if we have a point closer to the transducer, this pulse will be shorter and arrive sooner compared to the same pulse that has to travel all the way down to the bottom and back up. If we have a transducer with a narrow angle, this effect diminishes. In fact, as you can see, the red band becomes narrower. The outer part of our cone is a bit longer than the central part. And thus, the red band becomes narrower compared to before. Let's review. Low frequency band, hence a wide cone. Narrow angle for high frequency. The area below the yellow line is what identifies the transducer's cone of shadow or blind spot. And you can clearly see it on our fish finder. The yellow arrow corresponds to the central point, the point closest to the transducer, the one that reaches the seabed first. The blue arrow indicates the outermost point, generating the red band. In this case, even if, in theory, the fish is within the coverage of our transducer and receives a pulse, it will be located inside the red band. Now let's see what happens when we encounter a shallow area. Let's move over the shallows. Up until now, nothing has changed. If there was a target, any fish above our yellow curve, it can still be easily seen on our fish finder. Recapping the measurements we've seen before. The yellow arrow corresponds to the measurement of the point closest to the transducer, and the blue arrow represents the farthest point. Let's recap the measurements we've seen before. The yellow arrow corresponds to the measurement of the point closest to the transducer, and the blue arrow represents the farthest point. Now, the shallow area starts to enter the field of view of our ultrasonic pulse. As you can see, the yellow arrow has risen, and so has the entire arc corresponding to this measurement. Our fish finder will no longer provide the depth, which is visible here with the green arrow, because this arrow is within the red band. The farthest point, the end part, is always represented by the blue arrow. We continue to approach the shallows. 
As you can see, the value of the yellow arrow, hence the depth, is decreasing. The upper part of the red band rises, while the lower part of the red band remains constant because the blue arrow is always at the exact same point at the farthest point that our transducer can illuminate. And what if there's a fish below the yellow line, maybe near the shallows, can we see it? No, because as you can see, our transducer begins to draw the red band at the location of the yellow arrow. The fish located a bit lower ends up within the red band, while the outermost point of our ultrasonic beam, represented by the blue arrow, reaches here, and so the end part of the red band is down there at the bottom. As we get even closer to the shallows, the yellow arrow continues to rise, which means the depth on the fish finder decreases. Meanwhile, the outermost point remains the same. This is crucial to understand because when you look at your fish finder's display, especially when you're over a shallow area, it helps you determine whether you're near a steep drop-off, a rock, or a hole that creates this effect, this view of a very thick seafloor. In contrast, if you're over a flat, non-inclined seabed, the red band will always be thinner and narrower. We keep moving over the shallows, and you'll notice that the blue arrow hasn't shifted yet. We continue to advance, and here's where the change occurs. The blue arrow can no longer reach the lowest part of the seabed, and the fish finder once again shows us a narrow band with the upper part always representing the point closest to the transducer and the lower part representing the farthest point. Let's review these steps again, sequentially. Here we're in a situation with a flat seabed, and everything remains constant. As we get closer, the red band grows first above, and after reaching its peak, it starts to expand below as well. If we move forward again, it expands below once more, while remaining nearly constant above because our beam can reach the depths at the base again. Eventually, even the upper part descends. Please note that in all these situations, everything below our yellow arc is not visible. Any target in this position will always end up within our red band. So, when we stop over a shallows, keep in mind that when we're stationary, the fish finder always represents a flat sea floor like in this case, but under the seabed is not flat at all. Inside this red band, we can have numerous targets that aren't normally visible. By moving forward, we find ourselves in the situation of a flat seabed once again. This is why on fish finders, when we use dual channel frequencies, one low and one high, we see the low frequency displaying a wider lower part and a narrower upper part, while high frequency results in the opposite. Even wrecks or targets, as in this case, appear wider in the low frequency than in the high frequency. This is because the wider the cone, the more pronounced the effect I showed you, and the narrower the cone, the less pronounced the effect. And now, for the bonus. How is the fish finder screen displayed when we use shift? With shift, we effectively move the reading point of our fish finder. So, we have a higher value, the one closest to the transducer, which corresponds to the green arrow. We set this value on the instrument. We also have a lower value, the end of the instrument reading, which is under the purple arrow. This value goes all the way to the bottom of the screen, and the red band within our shift is defined by these two values. The yellow, corresponding to the point closest to the bottom, always to the transducer, and the purple, which represents the farthest point. With shift, we cannot see all the targets within these two cones. We don't see a rectangle. Instead, we see this shape, which consists of two truncated cones where we can observe the targets.
You need to think about it a bit because this way you'll better understand how your fish finder actually sees and reads the information. I hope this video has been helpful in clarifying your understanding. But be aware, it's not over yet. I have a little exercise for you to do at home, and I'd love to hear from you in the comments about how you solve it. I showed you a shallows, a rock, and how our fish finder behaves, how the red band expands and contracts. But if we're out fishing and there's a hole beneath us, not something rising but a crevice or a pit, that's also quite interesting. What do you think happens to the red band in that scenario? Imagine you're out on your boat cruising and you pass over a hole. Take a moment to think about it and write down what you think. After a few comments, I'll give you the solution. Thanks, and see you in the next video.